The town of Tain will be referred to many times during this presentation. So where and what is Tain? It is a small town in the highlands of Scotland where its two claims to fame are that it was granted a royal charter by King Malcolm III in 1066. I think the English were busy doing something else that day. <laughs> and became a royal barrow, the oldest in Scotland at that time. In 1966, I was in school in Tain where there was great celebration commemor commemorating this 900th anniversary. The other claim to fame Tain has is the home of Glenmore G Distillery. Mm. I've titled the presentation Made in Tain because without the people that worked and supported my father in the early years, this story would not have happened. So now moving back to when the story commenced. commenced. This book was published on the 21st of April 2019, which would have been the day my father would have been 100. He was born on the 21st of April 1919 at New Tarbot, Kilmere Easter which is located around four miles south of Tain. His parents worked on a farm at New Tarbot prior to moving to work for the MacDonald family at Moore Farm, just on the outskirts of Tain. Now, and very sadly, little else is known about my father's early years. This photo from the mid twenties is an early insight. My father was a very private person who talked little of the past and never boasted of his achievements. He did try and write his war year, about his war years, but his health had deteriorated and he was too frail to cover any more than his arrival at a training camp near Aldershot. Now I will always regret not sitting down with him to hear what he did through his early years, his war years and how he started up in business. Hopefully this book and the research that was commissioned has, will go a small way to correcting this. The research undertaken has uncovered some information on my father's war experience. And since his experience established his character, his grit and his determination, I will begin here. Alec Morrison joined the Seaforth Highlanders Territorial Army on the 21st of November 1938. The Seaforth, Seaforth Highlanders were part of the 51st Highland Division and they mobilized in readiness for war on the 1st of September 1939. In early October they arrived at Aldershot for training, training that was compressed from two years to just three months. The 51st arrived in France at La Havre in January 1940 and shortly after engaged in battle with the Germans. Due to political pressure, the UK had not invested heavily in defence, leaving the UK troops with World War I equipment. The Germans had taken a very different approach and had created a modern army. The 51st Highland Division were in a hopeless position. They spent four months in retreat ending up at St. Valery, where on the 12th of June, only five months of arriving in France, they were forced into surrender. The evacuation at Dunkirk took place between 26 May and 4th of June. The 51st Highlanders' gallant efforts did hold a large battalion of, German, of the German army back for sufficient time to allow the evacuation to succeed. 40 Tain lads were also at St. Valerie and were captured and few were able to get word home for two years. Here are pictures that were published of my father and my mother's brother, Andrew. Now Andrew's son is on this line. Um, now they were alongside the other 38 from Tain that were, and their pictures were all published in the Daily Record and the, the newspaper at the time recorded them all as missing. What their parents were going through puts our current woes into perspective. After surrender, the 51st Highlanders were marched up to the Rhine, a 
a distance of some 500 miles, and from where they were transported on barges and trains, eventually arriving at what was to be their home for five years, Stalagate B in Germany, and they arrived there on the 15th of July, 1940. This area is now part of Poland. What Alec, along with the others from the 51st Highland Division experienced for the next month following capture was just unimaginable. They were hungry, constantly threatened by their captors and suffering from extreme fatigue. Now this is the registration document that was filled in when my ma father, father entered the camp. When I first saw this, I did not immediately recognize my father. He is shaven and very thin. Shaven to get rid of the lice that were probably covering his body. And of course, and the weight had been lost through lack of food. Accommodation at Stalagate B was in long wooden huts and the bunk beds were stacked three high. Initially, the camp was occupied by 10,000, but this increased to 30,000 by October 43. Food was spartan and water and latrine facilities totally inadequate. We believe it was two years before my father's parents received a letter that confirmed he was alive. This would have been the same for all the families of all those that were captured. It is almost impossible to imagine. Now, these are some family photographs that my grandmother sent my father once she knew where he is. And each photograph has got what was written on the back on the left hand side. Life at Lambsdorff, where Stalligate B was located, was characterized by privation, tedium, frustration, and perhaps more than anything, uncertainty and anxiety. A lifesaver for many of the prisoners was the arrival of the Red Cross Paschals. With a low level of sustenance, health was a major issue. The Red Cross Paschals, which included basic medical supplies, of course helped here. My father did spend three weeks in the prison hospital in 1942, but we were unable to decipher from his medical records what the issue was, although we do know that he did have his appendix removed between 1939 and 1945. One somewhat undesirable activity at the camp which reduced the tedium was work. The prisoners were more or less slave labour for the Germans. Choice was not an option. Alec Morrison's skills were summarised as brickwork, building, dock work, farming, mining, and road building. As we understand it, he spent much of his time over the five years working in mines. Those back home in the UK and other parts of the Commonwealth were extremely supportive, sending Red Cross parcels, books, papers, and even bagpipes. This allowed the prisoners to publish a newspaper called The Clarion, put on light entertainment shows, and probably most important, the ability to read and to give hope that there would be life after Stalagate B. We do not know that Alec Morrison did think, we do know that Alec Morrison did think of his future, telling a mate that when he got home, he had no intentions of working, working for somebody else. And we guess laid down his plans to set up in business. War was starting to reach a conclusion early in 1945. And as the Russians started to march west, the Germans evacuated the prison camps, keeping ahead of the Russians. It is thought that this was to stop the Allied forces from bombing the Germans in retreat. This evacuation started in January 45, a time in Central Europe when one of the worst winters on record was experienced. Many of the prisoners died from cold, illness or were shot and the march came, became to be known as the Death March. Alec Morrison, like most of those that survived the war, talked little of his, his experience. 
We will never know why, but it could be that they don't, do not wish to remind themselves of, of the horrors that they experienced. It may be of being ashamed of being captured, or perhaps he felt that his experience was not as traumatic as those that fought for the five years. He did, however, tell us the odd story. My father did escape from the death march in 1945. And one story related to him and a few mates hiding under straw after escaping, placing a tin of meat above their heads to distract the dogs that were in pursuit. From this small handwritten note, found in just 2016, you discovered that Alec ended up in Leipzig with four mates, where they helped the US Navy to supervise German prisoners. A total role reversal. And I'll read this note, to whom it may concern. These five soldiers assisted the PM office, the Prison Management Office of Leipzig, in guarding and handling of German prisoners. I'll appreciate any help given to them to get them back to their own troops. And this was signed by Wally E. Flood, Flood who was a first lieutenant. And the first lieutenant is a position in the US Navy. We do, not, we do not know how my father got back home from Leipzig, but I'm sure it would not have been straightforward. Alec Morrison's war record was somewhat lacking in detail. But when he left military service in February 46, an officer noted, Alec Morrison was a man of above average intelligence, very tidy at his role, especially joinery, and good at it. Cheerful and hardworking with pleasant manner. Should do very well indeed. Based on his plans brought th thought through at Stalagate B, Alec set up his own joiner business in 1948. Alec married my mother Connie on the 3rd of April 1947 and their first son Fraser was born some 12 months later. I'm sure Alec would not have thought through the overall economic climate of the country, but this was a good time to set up in business. The country was obvious, obviously devastated by war, but there war, was, most importantly, a lot of optimism. I can only hope for a similar scenario following our current crisis. After they married, Alec and Connie stayed with Connie's parents before moving to their first home at 10 St Andrews Road. And I was born exactly three years to the day after Fraser on the 20th of March, 1951. Work very much dominated family life. My recollection was that daily conversation was all about the present and the future, and was about the present and the future with little if any time allocated to talking about the past. This may have been my father's way of avoiding talking about the war. How much of your past influences your future is never clear. Life in a small farm with four siblings would have required everyone to help out, with luxuries probably non-existent. Alex's father would have had to work very hard maintaining, probably on his own, a small farm that grew, that grew a wide variety of crops, potatoes, wheat and grass, and also a wide variety of animals pigs, dairy cow, and sheep. Come harvest, the whole farm, family would have, had, would have been involved. So my father had an early history of hard work, and during the war years, he would have had to develop entrepreneurial skills just to survive. When he escaped, the use of such, such skills would have been what kept him alive. 1948 saw the start of the Morrison business. Setting up a new business was always and will con continue to be high risk. My father very much focused on getting the best team around him. I knew all the people that worked for my father in those early days. They were all highly skilled. For, for funding, my father used the money saved up by his parents from his army pay. One of the essential skills any business leader requires is the getting to know and the developing of a good working relations 
relationship with employees, clients, suppliers, and most importantly, the bank manager. And as I was growing up, I recall all these people as family friends. It was my father's bank manager, a Mr. Gibson of the British Linen Bank, who persuaded my father to purchase his first lorry. My father always held, held Mr. Gibson in the highest regard. And here you see that lorry being dressed out for the Tain Carnival. Alec was an opportunist, as well as being an entrepreneur. And in 1950, he acquired the building activities of the local sawmill business. And by 1951, he had 10 employees. Housing was always a significant part of the business as the country promoted many projects to catch up with the shortfall post the war. In those days, housing, housing was the responsibility of the Tain Town Council who carried significant influence. As hard as he, as he tried, Alec never succeeded to win public sector housing work in Tain. Although never proven, Alec always thought that this was because he was not a Freemason. Undeterred, Alec did seek out and secure work elsewhere, which had given him both the geographical and diversity that was to prove useful going forward. Locally, Alec was able to secure land and successfully built some private houses. The first being on the outskirts of Tain, not far from Glenmorangie Distillery, followed by a project on Scotsburn Road where he built a house for himself and the family. Locally, there was an architect, John Ross, who did much of the design work. John Ross was married to my mother's aunt, showing the benefit of connections. The Morrison business had moved from just being a joiner and to become a carpenter, a front joiner and carpenter to a building contractor. And this picture displays that. And this was the, believed to be the first tipping lorry that my father owned. This invoice for a house built on Scotsburn Road, next door to my parents' house, was built for the French teacher in, at the Tain Royal Academy. And as you can see, it was built in 1958. Andrew Melvin became a lifelong family friend. And this is a painting of my parents' house from the 60s. It was obviously a very warm day that day. Although my mother is in a care home in London, this is still her home to this day. Building a loyal workforce was always a priority for Alec, and I seldom recall him having to pay off any of his workforce. Orders, orders in the construction industry never flow through evenly, so there are always peaks and troughs. The building of private housing would always help to keep things, keep things going because you had control there. Now, Morrison developed seven different housing sites around Tain. One of the first building contracts that I recall was Taylor's Garage in Invergordon. They were, that was for, they were the local Ford, Ford dealer. And this photograph clearly says the company had become a building contractor. Those in this picture were the guys that helped to build the business. Distillery work was very important in the growth of the company with Morrison working at Glenmorangie and Balblair. One of the most important contracts secured by Alec was work at Invergordon Distillery, where Alec got to know the developer of the distillery, Frank Thompson. And Frank Thompson encouraged my father to bid for work there. Invergordon was a very important sheltered naval harbour in the Cromarty Firth. This work, which extended over many years, primarily involved the building of warehousing. This would have been in the 60s, where the workforce had reached 200. Alec developed an amazing level of respect and loyalty among his employees, which my father repaid through, show, through showing an interest and supporting all the families. At Christmas, at Christmas time, he would give every employee a turkey, which was one of the main ways he repaid loyalty. With the business expanding, new premises were required. So he moved not about 100 yards to a new premises on Station Road. 
Employees that joined him in the very early days stayed with the company with many achieving 50 years of service. There was not one university degree among any of these guys, including my father. But over the years, they proved their worth, taking on more and more responsibility, overcoming every challenge that came before them. They were the nucleus of the company. Growth of the company became very rapid in the 60s on the back of the work at Invergordon Distillery. And this picture taken in 1964 shows that Alec was building up a fleet of lorries. Morrison secured some business from the Highland Regional Council, and this opened the opportunity to build schools. The first of these was at Hilton, located in a small, Hilton School, located in a small village, eight miles from Tain. The first pure civil engineering contract to be undertaken was at Kinloch Bervey Harbour on the west coast of Scotland. So here we see Alex starting to work further afield. The company was incorporated in 1963 as Alexander Morrison Builders Limited. This allowed Alec to take on more risk. In the same year, Alec employed his first accountant, Lawrence Allen, who continued to support my parents for 56 years. Alec looked after his employees and in re return, they showed incredible loyalty. Lawrence was the first professionally qualified employee of the company. The company was now of a size that professional management was essential, and this took the form of reporting of accounts, company records, and very importantly, health and safety. Education had become an increasing priority for council budgets. In the early 60s, school building became 25% of their budget. This gave the Morrison business new opportunities, and in 1963, they bid for two schools at Fort Rose and Ever Gordon. They were outbid at Fort Rose, but secured the Ember Gordon contract. This was a major and complex project that meant the company had to formally interface with professional design practices and had to respond accordingly. This would have been a fast learning curve, but one that was navigated well. Tain Academy was a project that Morrison had to win as the site was directly opposite my mother and father's house. Win it they did, and the school was opened in 1969. I was in sixth form and remember my class leading the march to the new school. There were issues at tender stage when Morrison seemed to have bid too, late, too low. But my father cut Hull short a holiday in Jersey and flew back and got the matter resolved. Alec very quickly understood the importance of education and ensured that Fraser and I had the full benefit encouraging us to go to university where we both graduated as civil engineers. Alec never forgot his roots in the Highlands and how important the people Tain and Tain were to the creation of the business. He gave back in many ways, with, which were too subtle to be noticed, but he did look after friends and those that worked for him. This is my father with one of his longest serving employees, John Fisher Ross. In 1966, my father supported the building of the Rose Garden in Tain and donated a sundial to the town. And this was part of the, of the 900th anniversary celebrations I referred to earlier. During the same year, Alec took a lease on a quarry six miles outside Tain and close to where he was born 47 years previously. Prior to this, all the quarry products came from Inverness, one hour away, and concrete was manufactured on site. The Morrison quarry business produced sand, aggregate, building blocks, ready-mix concrete and precast concrete. The ready-mix concrete came a bit later, requiring the concrete for Invergordon Distillery and Tain Academy to be manufactured on site. In 1969, three years after the quarry opened, British Aluminium took a decision to build an aluminium smelter at Invergordon. This was a great boost for the area and Alex's quarry business was a major beneficiary. The Morrison business at this time was too small to uh, undertake the major construction work, 
that Morrison did become involved in periphery work. Around the same time as construction of the smelter started, oil was found in the North Sea. Alec was to benefit from yet, yet another sector. So everyone, that takes me to the end of the first 50 years, 1969. My father had the amazing ability of putting himself in the correct place at the correct time and using his entrepreneurial skills to take full advantage. When, when some would describe it as luck, but managing your luck is yet another important skill. I would now like to invite Malcolm Noble, who did all the, who's the author and did all the research of the book, to say a few words. And here you'll need to unmute yourself, Malcolm. Thank you very much, Gordon. I hope you can all hear me. Um, you're saying that I did all... You say I did all the work there, but I'm having listened to you uh, telling the story just now. I'm not quite sure why why you needed needed me to do it. Um, I think this is I think what I, I really when I started doing this, um, and it seems quite a long time ago. What was really exciting about it was what I thought would be quite an, quite a nice story turned out to be a really interesting one. Um, what we've had here is sort of the first part of it, uh, and we're being left on a cliffhanger a bit. So, you know, during the war, there's the, uh, Alex was starting to think about what comes next and he quite quickly, really quickly, I think speed's important, plants the, the seeds for success that he goes on to, to reap. And, and that's a lot, loyalty uh, was something which comes across uh, time and time again across the story as we, I don't know exactly how contemporary uh, Gordon will take this but it's still still interviewing people working for the company or its descendants today um, still feel a great amount of loyalty uh, the flexibility is another strand that will that we've seen already with the uh, adding new types of business very quickly uh, and the quarry being really very important as well as uh, having a catalytic effect I, you can see the growth happening already in the business, although in a way it's sort of nothing to what comes. We see that a move to a new office fit for purpose um, for all that ambitious, all that ambition. We see more and more uh, people working for the business, but really perhaps more than anything, I think it's the, the range and scope, the geographic range that builds up, uh, the, the willingness to do all sorts of different kinds uh, of competencies. And, and the scope of jobs undertaken, still really small ones being taken uh, a long way into the, into the business's history. So um, I, I'm really enjoying having the, the story told again. And th thank you for that. Th thank you, um, Ma Malcolm. Um, so far we've covered my father's water years and the evolution of the business from very small beginnings in the north of Scotland with many of the important pieces of a jigsaw coming together. Um, part two of this story will happen on the 21st of April, and you will hear how very significant changes took place, which, reintroduced, which introduced rapid growth, the expansion of a very important culture, it includes working overseas, creation of an amazing utility services business, and the construction of some of the UK's most iconic structures. <laughs> 